Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Carol Stone, as most of you know, and with me is my co-chair, Jeanette Cernicke, and um, I am going to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, Kaylee Baines from the Environmental Working Group focuses on the intersection of public health and toxicology specifically improving human health by reducing chemical exposures. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Before joining EWG, Baines worked for the board on environment, environmental studies and toxicology at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, where she contributed to consensus studies and organized federally funded workshops. Prior to her work at the National Academies, she helped to develop toxicological profiles for the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry and supported green chemistry and product labeling programs for the Environmental Protection Agency. She's also contributed to community health and environmental justice initiatives at nonprofits and local health departments. Baines is active in the Washington DC chapter of the Sigma Chi Scientific Research Honor Society as vice president. She was a Fulbright Research Fellow and co-hosts the Medical Education <laughs> Podcast. She is an associate member of the Society of Toxicology. Um, and she is speaking to us from East Coast time. So it is um, almost 10 o'clock there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Kaylee. Thank you so much for that introduction, Carol. And uh, thank you all so much for having me. Um, as you mentioned, I'm on East Coast time. So I told my colleagues today that if no one falls asleep, including me during this call, it will be a successful talk. So <laughs> I really appreciate you all having me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. All right, so I'm very excited to be here. I've seen some snippets of past speakers uh, on the League of Women Voters YouTube channel. It was great to hear different perspectives on ecology and the environment uh, and some toxicology as well. So I'm changing things up a little bit today compared to some of the past speakers um, by discussing environmental health. So the human health impacts of exposures from the environment. And this can mean both the natural environment and the built environment or the infrastructures and behaviors that humans have developed that actually shape our own health. So with today's audience in mind, I thought I would talk about how one of uh, EWG's databases can help improve women's health specifically by reducing chemical exposures. Before I get too deep into the database, I wanted to just back up and give some background on Environmental Working Group and who we are. So EWG is a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit founded in 1993. So this year is actually our 30th anniversary. We were originally founded with the environmental policy and environmental decision making in mind, with a focus on lifting the curtain for the public and drawing attention to environmental and public health crises. Our goal is to empower the public with the information that you need to live a healthy life in a healthy environment. And we do this by educating people about chemical exposures in their environment, their food, air, water, their homes, and also by providing tools and resources to help you reduce these exposures. These are just a few of the tools that we've built for the public. So to start with, our shopper's guide uh, to pesticides and produce is an analysis of the United States Department of Agriculture data on pesticide residues in U.S. produce. We look at both the number of different pesticides present in the samples, as well as the amount of each pesticide present. And then this is what we use to generate our Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen lists, if you've heard about these in the media. Um, they're lists of the produce with the least and most concern for pesticide residues. So they can be used to actually reduce your own exposure to these pesticide residues based on um, your shopping and your choices. So the Clean 15 would be what we would recommend uh, in terms of uh, 
focusing your consumption there. Um, and then the dirty dozen would be the ones that are more contaminated. They have higher numbers of pesticide residues. And that's where you would really want to focus on trying to buy organic and reduce that consumption if you can't buy organic and, and really focus on those clean 15. Um, our tap water database allows you to enter your zip code and get information about contaminants in your tap water. Our EWG food scores database can, uh, combines nutrition information, processing concerns, and information on food additives and contaminants to help consumers uh, select their groceries in the store. And then finally, our interactive PFAS map uh, in wildlife uh, was just released last month. And this helps us keep track of per and polyfluoral uh, alkyl, polyfluoro alkyl substances, also known as forever chemicals, which you may have heard of. I've heard Dr. Blum spoke to you, um, so I'm, heard, I'm sure you know a lot about that uh, in detail. And so this map helps us actually track how widespread the contamination is in the environment. But today specifically, I want to talk to you about our database food uh, skin deep. And skin deep is um, specifically a database, one of the first ones that EWG created uh, for the public. And it was designed to help people select safer personal care products for themselves and their families. And so first, what are personal care products? Uh, when I talk about the work that I do and the databases that I help run, uh, people kind of hear personal care and they think, oh, makeup, cosmetics, I don't really wear makeup. This isn't relate to me. This isn't, uh, I don't have to worry about these exposures. And personal care products is actually a much bigger umbrella. You know, it's everything that you're using all the time. Your, your lotions, your soaps, your shampoos, your conditioners, shaving creams. You know, it's all of these different products. And so we really are all being exposed to these products all the time, every day, all day long. Um, and part of that is being exposed to all of the ingredients that are part that comprise these uh, products. So why are there so many ingredients? If you've turned over any personal care product, you can see a very long list of uh, ingredients, a lot of times an average of about 15, but we've seen up to you know 45. It can really range and depend on the product itself. Um, and a question, a question that we get a lot is why are there so many ingredients in my shampoo? You know, why is this formula so long? And first, different ingredients are serving different purposes in the formulation. So some may benefit your skin or hair, like a conditioning agent um, that keeps soap from drying out your hands, for example. Some might make the product feel better to consumers, like alcohols or oils added to thicken shampoo uh, or to keep them from foaming inside the container. Some might make product more enjoyable to actually use. So fragrances, colorants, they change the appearance and experience of using the product. And then some ingredients are there to protect the formulation uh, from bacterial growth and prolong the shelf life. So all of those are considerations that formulators think about when they're actually creating these products. Uh, ideally, you could have an ingredient that has multiple functions that can meet, you know, multiple bullet points at once and just still be a single ingredient, which would mean fewer ingredients overall, um, better from a sustainability perspective, for example, and potentially also for a reduction in exposure. Um, but not every product market uh, makes use of these multifunctional ingredients, as they're called. Additionally, competition between companies pushes companies to all try to create their own version of ingredients in order to set their product apart, which leads to even more ingredients on the market, even more confusion about how ingredients might differ, and then you're getting exposed to all of these ingredients as well. And finally, in the United States, pre-market testing for products is very rarely required uh, for personal care. And so companies can create a product, put it on the shelves with very little oversight. It's just about their internal validation methods and if they think the product is ready to go to market. So there's not a lot of information on the safety of these products or even the ingredients that make them up. <clears throat> so what's wrong with using these products and the ingredients that make them up? Ideally, nothing. Uh, however, not all products are made equal. So these data that I have up right now are from an EWG survey back in 2004, when our work in personal care was really just getting started and we were just building this, data this database. We found that women used an average of 12 products per day, 
and we're exposed to about 168 chemicals on average from these uh, products that they're using. And then men use an average of six products per day, leading to about 85 chemical exposures. And recent market trends have shown that the number of personal care products men use are actually increasing, um, but that women are still using more products on average. <coughs> And while a lot of ingredients in these products are safe, some of them have been associated with health problems and environmental degradation. Because women are exposed to more of these chemicals on average, unsafe ingredients and in personal care products may be contributing to health disparities for women, especially women of color, as you'll see in some of the studies that I'll discuss. So I want to stop here for a second and just give you a chance to read these article titles. These are all recent articles, either from the news, from um, journal publications, uh, local media. Um, they're all about women's health. It's understudied. It's underfunded. It's regularly dismissed. Women are told their pain isn't real, that they have anxiety, that their symptoms don't line up, that there are no answers, that their health really doesn't matter. And they're told that both to their face and doctor's appointments, but also in the way that research is actually funded on these type of issues. And so when I talk about differences in chemical exposures and health disparities that women face, I want you to remember this slide. And what I'm discussing today is just one piece of this overall puzzle about women's health and one contributing factor to negative health outcomes that women may face. There have been many studies on the health effects associated with personal care product use. Some of the studies have looked directly at the ingredients and their associated health out, uh, effects. Others have looked at the patterns of product use and their health outcomes associated with using products more frequently. And other studies have looked at both the chemicals and the frequency of product use. So all of these studies have really informed our thinking on personal care product safety. The studies I'm going to discuss on these next few slides are only a select few examples of all of the studies that are included in our database and in our ongoing research. It's important to note that many ingredients in personal care products are what we refer to as endocrine disrupting chemicals, meaning that they could impact the endocrine system. In other words, any process in your body that's controlled by hormones, which is most processes in your body, could be impacted by exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals. You may have come across recent news stories about different types of cancer in personal care products. This has gotten some attention in recent months, especially this first study, Chang et al. 2022. Um, an important thing to note in many of these is that many of these cancers that are getting a lot of attention right now in association with personal care products are hormone mediated, meaning that endocrine disruption can play a role in their development. So in a study published last year, Chang et al. found that women who had used chemical hair straightening products had higher rates of uterine cancer when compared with women who had never used the hair straightening products. This is especially relevant because a 2017 report by EWG found that products marketed to Black women in particular were more hazardous than products marketed to the general public. Black women are more likely to, than white women to use chemical hair straighteners and therefore likely face a greater risk of ovarian cancer from this particular source. You may have also heard of the recent Johnson & Johnson lawsuits uh, related to both mesothelioma and ovarian cancer from talc and baby powder. So a 2018 study reviewed 27 other studies on talc and ovarian cancer and found a consistent uh, association between the two. And then there are also animal studies that can look at how chemicals are causing health effects. Because uh, studies where humans are purposefully exposed to chemicals are unethical, animal studies may be used to ex examine exact amounts of chemicals and how they may or may not have an effect. So as an aside, there is a large movement looking at what are known as new approach methodology, methodologies or NAMs, um, trying to move away from the field of animal testing. But for now, a lot of animal data is still underpinning um, a large portion of toxicology as a field. So two studies that I wanted to highlight with regard to women's health and uh, exposures from personal care products are these animal studies from the Chatterjee Lab at McAllister College and Fang et al. 2016. So the first study from the Chatterjee Lab is ongoing. But basically, this chemical is a preservative that's found in both cleaning products and in some personal care products. And what they found was that by exposing rats to this chemical, they actually uh, found that these rats had uh, prolonged vulva pain. 
specifically because they think that they were sensitized by this particular chemical. And so they're using this as a model to talk about uh, women's gynecological pain and whether exposures from personal care products could be associated with the, these types of pain. And then the second study, the triclosan and placental effects. Triclosan is found in antibacterial soaps and toothpastes. Um, and there are some studies, including this one, that found that it can target the placenta and potentially impact pregnancy. In addition to some of the more established connections between personal care product ingredients and health effects, some research has proposed uh, potential mechanisms for how these chemicals might cause health effects, but haven't actually been able to prove these associations yet. And so this type of research sets the stage for future studies by identifying health outcomes that might be relevant to personal care product research. So as you can see here, it's really a list of potential associations um, that could be associated with these personal care product exposures. So things like menstrual cycle timing, um, fertility, PCOS, the age of onset of menopause. Um, something that I found in particular to be interesting was heavy metal contamination and autoimmunity, because um, as you may know, women are actually more likely to have autoimmune disorders when compared to men. And there are a lot of heavy metal contaminants in personal care products. And so finding that association between the two is very interesting. Uh, I have oh. a question. Sure. So I went and grabbed um, my CeraVe, you know, to see if any of the chemicals were in that, for instance. And so how do we jump from what you've said in the um, presentation to checking any of the things that we use? I'm so glad you asked. Um, I'm actually, the second part of the presentation will be how to use our database. Um, and how to actually compare products, because that is something that I do every day, and I'm very excited when people use it. So I'm getting there just slowly but surely. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, and so then one last thing that I wanted to talk about just in terms of setting the stage is children's health. So when talking about women's health, it's very interesting to me and also important um, that women's health and children's health is often intertwined. So obviously when it comes to maternal exposures during pregnancy, fetal health can be directly impacted. However, when fetal exposures are discussed, it's often in terms of fetal alcohol syndrome or drug addiction, or even bacterial exposures from food. Rarely do we talk about exposures from our personal care products and what they might mean for pregnancy. So when I was pregnant with my daughter, I had a ton of doctor's appointments as um, mothers on this call probably are familiar with. Uh, no one ever asked me about personal care products or advised me of ingredients to avoid. It was just never part of the discussion. And yet studies are showing associations between personal care product exposures and adverse outcomes in pregnancies, such as this 2019 study that found that using cosmetics at least five times per week was associated with a higher likelihood of the fetus being small for gestational age during pregnancy. And there have also been a number of studies showing chemicals from personal care products can cross the placenta and actually expose the fetus, although we don't necessarily know what the health implications of that are yet. And then in addition to exposures during pregnancy, mothers are also more likely to be the adult who shops for the family. So there are a bunch of different surveys done and the range is about 60 to 80% of women um, and mothers self-identify as the one who's doing the grocery shopping, doing the um, you know, target runs for their families. And so the actual choice of products is really being made by mothers. Um, and so that means that the choices a mom makes about which products are safe for her family are directly impacting which chemicals her child is exposed to. And now I've been researching, researching personal care products since before I was even pregnant. Um, and I've been very careful about the types of products that I use, the types of products that I buy. But kids shouldn't need to have a mom who's a toxicologist in order to figure this out. And that's where EWG is. Hi, Marlene. This is Bobby Spike from Cal Singles. Oh, I'm glad you you um you got back to me, you know. Roberta Sykes, yeah, mute. Yep, perfect. Um, so our response to all of this, um, as I was uh, just talking about with the different products that you can compare is a uh, skin deep database. So this is something that we created in 2004. And the goal is to actually allow consumers to look up their own products and know 
um, about them and be able to kind of decipher what does it actually mean? What's on the label? What could I use instead? If it's not a safe product, it, you know, is it even a safe product? All of those questions. And so the two main goals of the Skin Deep database are first to empower individuals to reduce their exposure to harmful, chem harmful chemicals. And then second, to move the marketplace towards safer products. So by buying products with safer formulations, we're showing the personal care industry that we care about what's in our products. And it's a way for us to really harness market forces to force the marketplace towards these safer alternatives because that's where the money is. And so actually using economic forces for good in that way. And so something that I wanted to touch on before I talk about exactly how the database works and how to access it is whether this even matters. You know, what does it mean to reduce our exposures? And we actually have seen that because we're using personal care products constantly, we're being exposed to these chemicals constantly every day. Um, but if we stop our exposure to certain chemicals, studies have shown that we actually can reduce the amount of these chemicals in our body, which is very promising. Um, for example, a study out of Berkeley known as the Hermosa study, if you've heard of it, um, gave team girls personal care products that did not contain parabens or phthalates, which are two groups of endocrine disrupting chemicals that are often used as preservatives uh, or solvents in personal care products. And when these girls use the paraben and phthalate free products, the levels of these chemicals in their urine actually decreased over time. And so what you can see is that even by making that small change, you're actually able to reduce your body burden of these chemicals. A more recent study, Darkie et al. 2023, uh, found that when women used paraben and phthalate-free products, not only did the levels of these chemicals in their blood decrease, their breast tissue actually changed and was potentially less prone to the development of breast cancer compared with women who did not change their paraben and phthalate exposure from their products. So by using Skin Deep to select safer products, you are actually able to reduce the amount of these chemicals in your body. So after I give a bit more of an explanation, I'll give you the website and the QR code so you can try it out for yourself. But I just want to give a little bit of information about how we created this and how to actually use it. So first, uh, it's a hazard rating based system. So you can see at the top here, uh, it's one to 10. And one is the safest. So these greens, the ones and the twos are the safest products that are in the database. And the 10, the reds are the most hazardous products that are in the database. And so what we do is we take a product and we break it down by ingredients. And we look at each individual ingredient and all of the research that's associated with each uh, ingredient. And then we build the, it, that into a product score and then rate the uh, uh, scale the product score on that one to 10 so that they're easily comparable uh, between different products. You can search the database by a specific brand name, a specific product type, like a hand cream or a soap or even an ingredient if you've heard of one uh, in the news, for example, that you're curious about. And then the way that we get this information. So we've got, for example, we have a, an ingredient um, and we need to know more about it. So we'll look at these three main types of information. We'll look at authoritative bodies, literature reviews, and industry data. So authoritative bodies would be government sources. We use a lot of federal sources like the EPA or FDA, a lot of California sources. So thank you to everyone who's done work in California uh, to get a lot of these chemical lists out. And then international sources. So Europe has stricter standards when it comes to cosmetics compared to the United States. Um, and Health Canada and Japan also have some very informative standards that we'll use when evaluating chemicals. We'll also do our own literature reviews. So go into PubMed, for example, uh, citations from reports that have come out um, and other database searches as needed so that we can actually read the original literature and see what has been studied and what is still unknown about a lot of these ingredients. And then finally, we'll also use industry data and reports. So there are industry groups uh, like the Cosmetic Ingredient Review, CIR, which talks about how these chemicals are used, and then IFRA and RIFM are two groups that talk about fragrance um, and fragrance safety. And then supplier data or safety data sheets, SDSs, are uh, compilations of data that specifically have an occupational health focus, but talk a little bit about irritation, use of the chemical, um, and what kind of risks might be associated with it. So we combine all of that information 
in to give you this product score. So this is an example of a product page. If you were to look it up, um, I don't have a, um, a brand name on here specifically because I don't want to call any brand out in particular, but this is an example of what it might look like. So what you can see on the left hand side, this would be the top of the page. You can see right away that it has a six. So it's not a very good scoring product. Um, there are some ingredient concerns and you can see these are the main groups of ingredient concerns, cancer, allergies and immunotoxicity, developmental and reproductive toxicity, and then use restrictions. Use restrictions would be if a different country, for example, doesn't allow this chemical in the product, but there is a chemical uh, in a US-based product that does have it, then that would give it points for a use restriction uh, to show that the um, actual regulations are a little bit weaker. And then what you will also see is the data availability fair. So that'll show how much data we actually have on the ingredients that make up that product. Then if you scroll down the page a little bit, you can see this is not a complete list, but this is just part of the list of all of the ingredients that are listed on the label. And you can see a lot of these ingredients, water, sodium chloride, dimethicone, they're all well-ranking products, or well-ranking ingredients, excuse me. Um, but then you can see sodium lauryl sulfate um, doesn't score quite as well, it's a three. And so you might be curious, you know, why is that? What do we know about it? And so you could go ahead and click that. That would then bring you to the ingredients page. And so you'll see the range. So it can be a one uh, if it meets certain restrictions, or it can be all the way up to a three. And so it will summarize at the top why that is. And in this case, there are concerns about um, lung irritation. There are concerns about contamination with carcinogens. Um, and there are concerns about uh, being used near the eyes because of a risk of absorption into your skin and into your eyes. If you scroll further down the page of the ingredient page, you can see all of this different information that describes it a little bit further. So the studies that show irritation, like those use restrictions that I mentioned, any data gaps. Um, and then what I think is actually very interesting is products with this ingredient. So if there's an ingredient that you read about and you're very concerned about, you can look at this to figure out products to avoid. Or if you read about an ingredient and you're impressed with that ingredient or you've used it before and it works well, you can also click that products with this ingredient and it'll show you other products that also contain that same ingredient. So now, now the part that people are waiting for is how can I access this? So if you have a camera on your phone, you can go ahead and scan that QR code. And if you just open up your camera and point it at the code, which is that this image in the middle, um, it will just automatically pull up the link. Um, if you don't have a camera or don't want to use it right now, you can visit ewg.org slash skin deep. Um, or if you're into apps, which I am not, but a lot of my friends are, um, using the Healthy Living app in the app store. So I'll give a second just so people can go ahead and try that. about another minute or two, and I can always come back to this slide after I um, go through my last few so people can keep using it. All right, so why people are finding Skin Deep? I also just wanted to touch on how you can get more involved if you're interested. So first of all, as I mentioned, choosing safer products, uh, sharing Skin Deep as a resource, you know, showing the industry that you care about these formulated products and you care about safer products. But moving the marketplace can't just be on the consumer. We can't just buy our way out of this problem, especially when we consider the disparities that can perpetuate that we can perpetuate by relying solely on financial choice. Um, there's actually recent work out of Harvard that used our database to look at hazard-based um, approaches to what products are being sold in certain neighborhoods. And they actually found that neighborhoods where most residents are people of color are actually 
more likely to have stores that sell more hazardous personal care products. And so we also need legislation to fix this issue. And I know that's something that League of Women Voters uh, has done a lot in a lot of different ways to support. So I wanted to touch a little bit on that. Um, I'm not a government affairs expert. We have those on staff. Uh, so I'll just briefly touch on this. But if there's more information that I can provide later, I'm happy to put you in touch with our government affairs team. Uh, so first is California's uh, Assembly Bill 496. So that was authored by Assembly Member Laura Friedman and was sponsored by EWG. And this is specifically to ban certain chemicals in California personal care products or personal care products sold in California uh, to align more closely with European regulations. So they're a group of over 20 chemicals that are identified in this bill, and they are no, not allowed in personal care products in Europe, but are currently used in personal care products in the United States. And so this bill talks a little bit about why that is and pushes for a ban on those particular products. So that's one thing to support. I believe it's in committee right now. Um, the other thing could be to help other states advocate for similar legislation. California and New York tend to lead a lot of this legislation. They tend to be kind of a step ahead um, in comparison with other states. And so it's really great to see what California is achieving and also figure out ways that other states can address these same issues. And then finally, uh, watching the impacts of MOCRA, which is the Modernization of Cosmetics Regulation Act of 2022. It passed at the end of last year. Um, which is a big deal because really FDA's authority for uh, personal care product uh, legislation and, and oversight hadn't been updated in decades. And so this is the first really big update, um, and it still remains to be seen exactly how it'll look in practice, uh, but we're pretty hopeful that it will help do um, achieve some safer product goals. Additionally, it uh, requires companies to report any adverse outcomes that they identify uh, in their products or that people report to them by with use of their products, which is a big deal as well. So just in conclusion, um, something that we like to say at EWG is that we work for you and we're not going anywhere. And this is just something that we really want to emphasize. Uh, we do work for the public and we want to make sure that what we're doing is useful and informative and empowering. And so we welcome any feedback and we also are excited to keep working together on this journey for safer products. So thank you so much. Um, I'll minimize my slides so I can go ahead and answer any questions. And actually, let me go back to the Skin Deep slide in case anyone wants to get that uh, URL still. And Carol, I can turn it back to you if you have questions. I can't see the chat right now, but once I minimize, I can. Okay. Anyone can turn, oh, raise their hand if they'd like, or write in the chat if you have a question. And I'll also put the URL in the chat in case anyone prefers that. Okay, if we're members of um, EWG, can we get, we can, get to that skin deep through the website? Yes, but even non-members, anyone can access anyone. it. It's freely available on the website. Yep. And also in the app store, <laughs> if anyone uses apps. I not I don't yet, but you know, my siblings are Gen Z, so they're encouraging me to do so. <laughs> we usually have a lot of questions. Um, I have a question about, well, we, wait, Anne, did you have a question? I didn't read all of what you had to say here. It looks like Janice too. Sorry, don't wanna. Yes, my question is whether um, uh, Kelly thinks that the uh, um, endocrine disruptors may be a factor in gender dysphoria. Good question. So I'm not an expert on gender. Um, I would say really what I'm looking at when I'm talking about uh, endocrine disruption is this uh, health impacts that can be diagnosed such as cancer um, or reproductive health, <laughs> issues, things of that nature. Um, I would have to be more of an expert on gender and sexuality than I am to answer that question, I think. So 
Um, I have a question. Janice. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, so I, I did the thing on my, what are those little square things called? <laughs> I, I did that, but then I just ended up at a, um, taking a survey of some sort. And so I, I tried to race through that to get to the uh, guide. And um, so I still haven't gotten to the guide where I, to try it out and put in, for instance, CeraVe moisturizing cream and see how your website actually works. So can we pick something and watch you do it or- you I'm happy to do that. Um, I also put the link in the chat so that you can access it as well. Um, but okay. sure, and let me see what, what link you put in there. Yep, it's just Oh, it's yeah, so I went to, yeah, I got as far as ewg.org and it should be skin deep, huh? And skin deep, or if you just Google skin deep, it will also come up, but this is our official website. Um, but you said CeraVe, what was the? CeraVe, yeah, moisturizing cream. Okay. Okay. So where so did you put it in? I, is that the sorry. first? Yes. Yeah, so right here, it says search for ingredient, product, or brand, or brand or product. And if uh, you click it, and then you start typing, it will okay. suggest things to you. Um, so sometimes I'll just pick something here if I see it, it's like the moisturizing, moisturizing cream. cream. It's just your yep. basic. Yeah. And you can just click it, and it will take you immediately to that page. So it's a three, um, definitely on the less hazardous end of the spectrum, but yeah. technically we are looking for a one or a two, those green products. Um, but generally, you know, a, less hazardous than any of these other products up here. Uh, if you look data availability limited, which means there are some ingredients that don't have a ton of data on them, um, low cancer risk, um, high allergies and immunotoxicity, which is not uncommon. Um, and then low developmental and reproductive toxicity, moderate use restrictions. So we can continue to scroll down. Um, and so then here you can see where to buy it if you wanted to buy it, um, the category that it's in. So a moisturizer, the brand, and then the last update, which is 2021. So if you put it all, does it have anything? Okay, let's scroll down to see. Thank you for showing me this. Sure, yeah. So here are the ingredient scores. So you can see, there are a lot of green ingredients, a lot of good scoring ones. Uh, then there are some like these two that don't score quite as well. Dimethicone doesn't score quite as well. Um, so I can give an example of any of those, but like I said, a lot of green, which is good, but let's go ahead and look at yeah, the dimethicone. One. Yeah, yeah, or that, yeah, phone so, usually needs a... If I click it, it shows the actual function. So what is it used for? Why is it in the product? Um, and then the concerns. So use restrictions, um, some persistence and bioaccumulation, which is specifically to the environment, um, non-reproductive organ system toxicity. So, and then some ecotoxicity uh, outside of persistence and bioaccumulation. So usually that means aquatic <coughs> toxicity. So if we Thank click you. learn more about this ingredient, we can see it's a two to four depending on the usage. So I'll go down on the ingredients page to see what we're concerned about. So the organ system toxicity is one that got flagged, expected to be toxic or, toxic or harmful specifically because it's listed on Environment Canada's domestic substance list. Um, use restrictions, recommended restrictions in cosmetics, and this is from one of those industry sites that I mentioned, which is the Cosmetic Ingredient Review Assessment. And then persistence and bioaccumulation, some uh, data from the scientific literature, as well as, like you saw below, the Environment Canada domestic substance list, which is uh, talking about the environmental impacts. And then you can go down to data gaps, um, and it talks a little bit about what information is needed to know a little bit more about the safety of this chemical. Um, and then what information has been identified just through searches. And if you go back to the top, it talks a little bit more about what this is and why. So not an a extremely concerning ingredient, not like it's a PFAS, for example, which are more the nines and the tens <clears throat> that we're seeing, 
um, but some concerns. And we can go to a different ingredient to show some concerns as well. So we'll try this one. So this one is a hair conditioning agent and has a lot of concerns there. Learning more about this ingredient. We can then see allergies and immunotoxicity is again getting flagged. So if we go down to the bottom and look at that, uh, these are scientific literature reviews. And something that we're talking about doing in the update this year is to actually list the studies individually instead of just saying the, the literature review, actually referencing studies so that people can go and see those. So that's a change that we're making soon as well. So what was the name of that one? So this one, yeah. the enteronium methosulfate, which is part of the CeraVe moisturizer. Yeah. The other okay. thing that's interesting to do is that so we're on the moisturizing cream. We can go down and it has some explanations, but it also has other moisturizers here in case you are interested in different products that also are moisturizers. You can view all moisturizers and then sort them from best to worst and kind of just go through and see what other options are well are rated well um, in uh, this. System. That's important. Yeah. Great. And so then sunscreens, I noticed that both of my sunscreens have um, titanium dioxide. Yes. So can, can you show me, so can we put titanium dioxide in that search for an ingredient? Sure. So this is a really interesting one because um, we specifically want to talk, there's a couple different pages for it, but titanium dioxide sunscreen grade. So yeah. the interesting part about titanium dioxide is that it is an effective uh, UV filter, but you don't want to ever have it in a spray. So for example, um, a lot of spray sunscreens might contain this or zinc oxide. And it's actually associated with lung problems if you were to inhale it. So what we say is that titanium dioxide is a good scoring ingredient down at this green two as long as it's not in a spray product. We don't wanna see it in sprays um, for that reason of the lung toxicity. But as a mineral sunscreen um, ingredient, just in a, a, a sunscreen cream, then we think that it's a safe ingredient, but that's gonna all be included here, so. So I, I put it on the other day and then I realized I put it on my lips, but not to worry or avoid my lips or. You know, I mean, so the other thing about titanium dioxide, which you might have heard of, is it's getting a lot of coverage in the news um, because it's also a whitening agent. And so it's used in foods. Um, it's used in Skittles, actually, to make that white coating before they add the color. Um, and ingesting titanium dioxide potentially could cause some issues. There are some studies on GI issues associated with it. Um, and there's actually a push currently, I believe also in California and also a, a bill that EWG was working on about um, food additives and titanium dioxide comes up there. And so, I, you know, uh, it's, wor it's worse to burn your lips, right? You don't want sunburn on your lips, but you also don't want to really ingest titanium dioxide. So it's okay to have it there um, and to use your sunscreen as it should be used, uh, but don't try not to, to ingest it or inhale it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Other questions or I can stop my share so I can see people better. If, if no one else has a question, I have another one. But... Oh, I have a question. Okay, good. Um, has there been, and you were, <clears throat> at the beginning, you were talking about some of the cancer and the diseases that, and the talc and that people got from various things. Um, years ago, my mother dyed her hair all the time as she got old. I never saw her with gray hair. <laughs> and, um, she ultimately died of endometrial cancer. Has there been any linkage between hair dyeing and, and some sort of adverse health effects? There has been. It's actually um, it's complicated. Yeah, about that. So some of the same some of those same studies that found the association with uterine cancer also looked at hair dyes and other products. And the only product that they found the strong association with that they actually statistically could find and say this is an association 
what were those hair straightening products? Um, usually they contain lye or formaldehyde, very, very strong chemicals because what they're doing is breaking the bonds in curly hair and straightening them chemically. There are some studies that point to bleach, for example, um, and hair dyes as also causing these issues. It's just a little bit less clear in terms of the association. Um, and in that particular study that I mentioned, they did not find an association, although other studies have, or at least think that there might be in the future. I would assume from all of the kind of work that you're doing, that somehow the FDA or some agency should be in charge of approving all these products. Is the, I know it sounds like you're working on particular individual bills, but is there a push to get, we've got a lot of women in Congress now, we didn't used to, we've got a lot of, you know, this could be very much a bipartisan issue perhaps. Um, is What is the possibility of getting um, the FDA or some agency in charge of approving these products, the personal use products. So this is something that EWG talks a lot about, <laughs> as you might imagine, uh, with our background in policy. Uh, MOCRA was a really big deal. So the modernization um, of the Cosmetics Act, uh, Co the Cosmetics Regulation Act that I mentioned at the very end. Um, and that was, it's a big deal because that was the first time it's been updated in decades. And that was really trying to give FDA more authority to enforce and to have oversight over these products. Unfortunately, um, while it does a good job of closing some of the loopholes, it does not close all of them. And one of them is that, well, two of them. One is that um, it doesn't require pre-market testing. Um, and the second is that smaller companies, it's going to be a lot harder for them to meet these standards. And I think that they are probably going to need to involve third parties in their evaluations. And so that's something that's ongoing is who's doing these evaluations if they are getting done, um, you know, what kinds of studies are happening before they go to market. And at this point, um, it's, we call it kind of the wild west in a lot of ways. Um, things are kind of just going to the shelves. People are buying them and assuming because they're being sold in stores, they're safe because why would you sell something unsafe in a store? And what we're seeing is that's not entirely true. Um, you might look for, you know, allergic effects. So companies do things called um, patch testing. They'll put patches of whatever product they're trying to sell on human skin for a study, and they'll see if there's an allergic reaction. But that's really what you're seeing before market, whereas things like cancer might take years to develop. It's not something that can really be studied effectively before it gets to shelves. And so then you get studies like we're seeing now where we're seeing these associations, but it's too late. People have already used all of these products. And so that's really what we're trying to push for is good formulation and really thinking about the hazard of these individual chemicals and what that actually looks like. And is there very good ability to do pre-market testing without the use of animals? I would say no, and that's my opinion. Um, at this point, there are, as I mentioned, NAMs, the new approach methodologies. Uh, there is a big push because ethically, obviously, we all want to get away from animals. Um, it's hard to read those studies sometimes and, and what has to happen to get that information. Um, as of right now, it's not a fully developed field, and a lot of it has to do with modeling. Um, and so, you know, your conclusions are only as good as your model. Eventually, we hope that the models are great and that they're accurate all the time. It's just hard to get that information at this point. But the National Academy of Sciences is actually doing a study right now that's EPA funded about NAMs and how to use them better. Uh, so hopefully when they publish that in the next little bit, um, that will kind of move the field forward. Okay, can I ask another question? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so... Taking all this information, can I or we assume that European cosmetics, Japanese cosmetics, and Canadian cosmetics are safer, or we can use those cosmetics and will be safer than using U.S. cosmetics? That is a good question. So. Yes and no, <laughs> right? The, it's not. It's a little bit gray. Um, but in a lot of cases, um, when you look at certain chemicals, yes, there are going to be phased out, um, especially in Europe, compared to the U.S. 
However, um, it's sometimes difficult, especially when we talk about things like sunscreens, which are a little bit different because there is some pre-market testing required um, and there are other requirements that FDA has, um, but they're not FDA approved in the United States, uh, a lot of the European sunscreens and sunscreens that are sold in Australia. And so we can't actually get them, <laughs> um, even if we think that they might be better or they might have safer chemicals involved. Um, and so that's a very specific subset just for sunscreens. You know, FDA doesn't have to approve a lipstick, for example. Um, but I wouldn't say across the board, just absolutely only use products from other countries. Um, but that's why we incorporate those uh, those criteria and those findings into our database and so that you can look up products that are easily available to you in American stores and see, OK, how does this actually rank um, when compared with other products? Okay, I don't understand what you said about the FDA does not let Australian sunscreens in. Yes. What do you think? So, so that's it's interesting. So there are only a few um, what they're called are UV filters. So what gives you SPF um, allowed in the United States based on testing that FDA did require. And so sunscreens are kind of a special case. Unlike other personal care products, there is testing involved um, because of skin cancer risk and because you really want to have efficacy data. Um, and because of that, a couple of ingredients have been tested to make sure that they can actually block UV light. Unfortunately, while they do work, and, and zinc oxide and titanium dioxide are two of those, while they do work, there are newer ingredients that we think might be better based on their hazard profile and might actually block more types of UV light that are allowed in um, European sunscreens, and they're allowed, I believe, in Canadian sunscreens, Australian sunscreens, a lot of sunscreens um, outside of the U.S., but because they've never been used in U.S. sunscreens, the, the FDA has never evaluated them and can't say whether or not they're safe and meet their efficacy standards. Meanwhile, industry doesn't want to submit all of those data because it's costly and they're already selling um, products with zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, and the other approved uh, UV filters. And so it's sort of a catch-22 where no one knows exactly what we should do to make sure we can get these better sunscreens. Um, it's interesting to hear as people, especially that are passionate about sunscreens, bemoan the fact that they can't go and buy their favorite European sunscreen because it's not actually approved for use in the United States. So it's, it's a, a very lot. complex topic. <laughs> so, and so does, can you buy it on Amazon, go on to Amazon for Europe or something and get it sent to you? So legally, you should buy sunscreens that are allowed to be sold in the United States is what I can officially say. But I can say that other people have bought them from international sellers. Um, but officially, what you are allowed to do in the United States is to buy sunscreens that are FDA approved. Okay. And what about in Mexico? What's, what's, anyway, we, I, we don't need to go any further. So um, my other thing is like marks like Clinique. This is Clinique. Like I always use Clinique because they said that their, their things were kinder or had fewer chemicals. So that's something we talk a lot and not even just specific to Clinique, but so, and not to accuse Clinique of anything, but there's a term called greenwashing. Um, and we see it a lot in so-called clean beauty. And it's basically a movement to make claims like that without actually having anything to back them up because nobody is checking to make sure that those claims meet any requirement. Basically, they're just marketing claims. And so you can define them as a company however you wish. And as long as you are defining them clearly, they can mean anything to you. So even when you see things that say uh, paraben free or no parabens, they actually mean different things. They could mean no intentionally added parabens. They can mean no parabens above a certain amount. Um, and so what we see in a lot of brands is that they'll say things like that, that are really marketing claims. And they really just wanna cash in on the clean beauty trend without doing the work to formulate well. And so that's why we suggest Skin Deep as a resource is because we actually look into the ingredients um, and actually see, okay, they're claiming to be these clean beauty brands and they're claiming to be less hazardous, but are they actually in and do they actually meet those criteria? Um, and so sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. <laughs> and that's why we have kind of almost a third party way of, of actually evaluating things like that. And so then back to your site, I can put Clinique on your search bar and then 
the site can help me sort that out. Yes, exactly. Okay, great. Um, and if that's the other thing to, to say is that if you ever are looking for a product and it's not in there, um, we can feel free to contact us uh, or build your own report on the site, which I'll share my screen one more time just to show. Um, but this part right here that says build your own report, it has a bunch of instructions, but basically you put in the ingredients from the label of the product that you're interested in, and it will give you a report based on our data. Um, so if your product isn't in there, you can still see about what it would score if it were in there. Um, and then also, obviously, anyone is welcome uh, to reach out to us and ask about a certain product, and we're happy to put it in. We put in about 5,000 new products a week, um, so we can always add more to that. I promise, you know, <laughs> my my colleagues work. <laughs> I'm not the one who enters those, but um, but it's, it's a lot of team effort, and it's a very uh, iterative process, so we're always happy to have feedback. Is, do you find any correlation between the cost of a product and the health efficacy of the product? You can buy a lipstick for under $2. You can buy a lipstick for $40. Is there likely to be any difference or to go up beyond a certain rate where it starts to change or, or is there no correlation at all? So that's a really interesting question. Um, it's kind of multifactorial, like a lot of the questions, but there's you can't have an exact association between price and safety. Um, but a lot of the ingredients that are higher quality, for instance, if you don't want contamination with heavy metals, that means you're going to have to use good manufacturing practices and make sure you purify your ingredients. And those things cost money. So in some cases, there, you are getting safer products at the higher price point. But what we tried to do when we created Skin Deep is also look at things that are just being sold to the general public. So what's on the shelf at Target? We sent a bunch of interns out to just look at the shelves at Target and see what's going on. Um, something that Harvard is doing right now um, in their Restyle project is uh, R-E-S-T-Y-L-E, -E, Restyle is the um, acronym for their project. But they looked at EWG scores and they actually mapped neighborhoods um, based on the, the stores and what they were selling. Um, and what we've seen in their study and also in some other studies from other uh, nonprofits is basically that dollar store uh, type stores are going to sell more hazardous products um, in a lot of cases, not across the board. But um, yes, we are seeing that association in some of the research that's coming out. And the issue there is that then the people who are shopping at those stores are more likely to be low income and already have other health impacts based on their occupation, based on their ability to get um, healthy non-processed foods, you know, based on all of these other factors that are socioeconomic. And in addition to that, are also living in areas where they're being sold cheaper, less safe products. Um, and so it's just kind of all of these different environmental impacts and environmental factors that are related to all of these health outcomes. And then you build in health insurance availability and availability of pr primary care physicians. And it just becomes this soup of environmental just injustice problems um, that happen. And so it is something that we've seen and it's something that we're trying to figure out a way to effectively address with Skin Deep and beyond. These dollar stores just show up in people's neighborhoods and get the other stores that are better qualified to give you better things will tend to just go away. Yep. Do we have some other questions, folks? I don't... Oh, there's something in the... Uh, it looks like Ruby has a question. Yeah, yeah. I have oh, a question. <laughs> Um, so about maybe 30 years ago, um, Dr. Bruce Ames, UC Berkeley and also uh, UC San Francisco, um, is a pretty eminent scientist. And he and his group studied um, the ability of liver to change certain chemicals into carcinogens. And they were pretty successful, although it sounded kind of crude, this, this sort of test where they just put um, 
you know, liver from mice in with the chemicals and then uh, incubated them and then analyzed the result. And surprisingly, at that time, they found that there were a number of um, commonly uh, ingested uh, chemicals that did become carcinogenic after being processed by the liver. And I really don't follow, haven't followed this uh, research in a long time, but, you know, is it possible that some of those, there still remains a lot to be um, determined about the potential carcinogenicity of additives um, that might be ingested by people. Absolutely. So um, one thing that you mentioned that I think is really important to emphasize is that in toxicology, kind of the main principle is called ADME, A-D-M-E, um, and it's absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. So absorption, how you're getting it in your body, distribution, where it's going in your body, metabolism, what your body's doing to it, and excretion, how you're getting rid of it. And so metabolism is extremely important because sometimes you'll have a chemical that you're exposed to, and that chemical itself might not be that hazardous. Um, it might not really be associated with any health impacts, but once your body metabolizes it, it can break it down into byproducts that actually are damaging and can cause problems like cancer. Um, and so that's a huge part of toxicology is figuring out, okay, this is the chemical that you're exposed to. What does it break down into? And that's part of that data gathering stage that we have where we're looking at the literature PubMed and we're looking at other countries and what they're doing is we're looking at, you know, are there studies that show that some of these chemicals are breaking down into byproducts that are more hazardous. Um, so that's extremely important. Um, with the idea of additives, uh, we have, as I mentioned, the food scores database, and we're actually working with University of Maryland right now um, on some updates to that database. And additives is something that is coming up constantly. Um, it's just a really difficult question. I call it kind of whack-a-mole because with food additives, a lot of analysis are uh, analyses are generally generally recognized as safe. Um, so it's been on the market for a while. People have been exposed to it for a while. There's this assumption of safety, but it's also difficult because if most people have been exposed to something, it's hard to see the difference between whether or not it can cause a health outcome because basically there's no control group. Um, and so, you know, it's, there's a lot of argument there about how safe a lot of these food additives are. Um, as I mentioned, the California bill that EWG is sponsoring um, and working with um, different legislators on does include some food additives and how to get rid of those. Uh, Skittles is that big one that keeps getting the news because Skittles in the U.S. have titanium dioxide. Skittles in Europe don't. <laughs> um, you know, how safe is safe and, and what are the kind of lines that we draw on the sand there, I think is the constant discussion in this field. By the way, I tried to look up the AB 496 on the League of California website and they have not yet taken a position on it, but the League does take positions when they've done studies or when the bill has gotten further enough along. Which brings me to the question is, what can we as a league do to you know, move along the kinds of work that you're doing that I think is very much in line with many of our studies for safety and women's health, et cetera? Yes, um, I would say, and again, not, not a um, policy expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I would say that one of the real strengths of League of Women Voters and something that I was really excited about when I received the invitation to speak is how much information you're able to give voters and how much you're able to actually influence and educate people who have a say in this. And so I think um, with regard to that particular bill, um, if you were to feel the feel so moved to support it, that would be um, something that definitely would move that work forward. But just generally having the opportunity now here to talk to all of you um, and also the YouTube channel, uh, just generally about our work and about how to get involved. So supporting 
uh, better and stricter standards and actual enforcement for personal care products, um, supporting alternatives assessment. So the replacement of uh, chemicals that are maybe more hazardous with ones that are hopefully less hazardous and, and all of that type of work that we do education wise, kind of motivating the electorate <laughs> to actually care about this as one of the issues. I think, um, you know, climate change gets a lot of attention, well-deserved attention, um, a lot of different parts of environmental health and the environment get attention. I think personal care sometimes doesn't because we just don't think about it. It's something that we're so used to doing. We've been doing our whole lives and we don't question it as much. And so kind of just making this an issue that people are interested in and people wanna learn more about is really huge and really I think helps reduce exposure and it helps actually move the marketplace and, and move the needle on this type of formulation. A couple things Celie did do in the past that you may or may not know about. We were did a lot of work on eliminating single-use plastic. We've done a lot of work in passing a sugar bill for health drinks a, a while ago, and um, it, we we do, do we try very much to work on on bills of this sort, but it has to be sort of more specific. <laughs> <laughs> but that four nine six is it will look into it. That's specific, but yes, let me I um, see something oh. done at national level if possible. <laughs> yeah, let me go ahead and put here is the link in the chat to the bill and how to track it, um, okay. just in case people are interested. Oh, okay. I did a screenshot with that. Now, somebody, Sylvia B, to everyone, can you read that? My brother is an MD and it sent me this link. A story in psychology today. The human beast. Gender fluidity. Gender fluidity and hormone disruptors question mark amp. That seems to be a response to an earlier question that was asked and a place to look for some information about it. Any other questions or comments? Well, I think that we can, I wanna make one comment, which is, it seems to me that the Environmental Working Group is the consumer reports of um, personal care products and <laughs> products. I'm gonna have to write that on our website. That's a great review. <laughs> and we thank you very much for really in, informative and introducing this site to at least some people here who may not be familiar with it. Um, and it sounds like it's always being expanded and improved. So I think quite a few of us will follow it. Thank you. I'll be sharing it with my women relatives in particular. Wonderful. Thank you, Nancy. Okay. Thank you so much. And you get to sleep. <laughs> Thank <15 you>. minutes <laughs> earlier. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, I really appreciate your time. Um, this is definitely my soapbox issue. So I really appreciate you letting me have a soapbox for so long. Um, and for all of your great questions and involvement and your work um, as League of Women Voters, it's just hugely important. I told my mom that I was speaking to you all and she was just giddy. <laughs> so I'm just, uh, for the generations that, you know, have come before, that have come after, thank you for everything that you do. And we actually generally have more men than we have today, but this one was focused more on the women's interest, but we'll get some men involved too. <laughs> so I, I have one more comment on that legislation since Ken Diaz here. You know, um, Diaz is one of the people that is, and her name is uh, Diz Swift, is one of the people in the California League that is reviewing legislation and would be one of the obvious people to 
contact about getting that legislation through. What is it? Three nine. Was it four, four nine six? Maybe four nine six. I, I have it down, and I. Yeah. Anybody wanted to call? I, I'll kind. I'll I'll ask her about it, but other people could ask her too. And, and Janice, this is Tricia. You know, uh, Kaylee might be very interested in having Dis Swiss. Um, uh, you know, being on her mailing list, this is, uh, Kaylee, this is a woman who does ca all California and she does, she has these emails with terrific links and what people are doing here in the state about a lot of environmental issues. She's a real resource. I, maybe you could, Kaylee, you could get it from Carol, uh, Dis Smith's uh, email. Uh, I'd be happy to give it to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah and she also will can, can consult the YouTube channel. She did it with Gary Griggs last week. So last month that <laughs> she was going to watch it on the YouTube channel. Who? Diz. going to watch? I said Diz last oh, Diz. month. Watched yeah. it. Yeah. I'm, talk, said, uh, yeah. yeah. I'm talking about the email that she sends out sort of with an overview every six months or so of a lot of issues that Kaylee might just be interested in receiving to see what's happening over here in the West. <laughs> oh, you mean it in the reverse, that this should send it to Kaylee. Got yeah, it. that Kaylee would get on the mailing list and just be one of the person on the distribution list for that. That would be great. I am part of many listservs and I read them. Yeah. Really generally, so that's one great. more. Thank one you. more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Janice, I'm happy to follow up, however, you know, we can talk outside of um, this event too. Wait, what are you saying, Candia? I couldn't understand you. Oh, I was saying I'm happy to help, um, however, in terms of connecting with Diz um, and seeing what's possible at the LWBC level, right? Because that's where this would have to go. Um, so we can right. communicate about that um, outside the event if that, if that works. Right. We're organized in such a way that the local league, then we have a regional league, then we go up to the state league. And <laughs> An A B, you know, an assembly bill is a state level issue. So action has to be taken at that level ultimately. Okay. This is reviewing two weeks ago, she was reviewing the state legislation. I don't know what she's doing right now. Anyway, bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all so much.